Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Foz Charles. I've been a member of this society for decades. And you can tell by, I once had dark hair. And I am also a member of the uh, conference committee, laboring under Barbara Lowe, who's our taskmaster. But it's a great committee to be on because we not only try to think about the topic, we think about who might talk about the topic. I mean, there is a, a formal open call for papers, but we also kind of try to search out people. And then we have great discussions when the proposals are in as to you know, who we're going to select. So I love being on the committee. I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Jeremy Rowe. He first got interested in photography when he was a grad student and tried to take a class in photography. And he went out to a flea market and bought a daguerreotype, and he was hooked. He has been, uh, he's on the board of the daguerreotype society. He's on the board of the ephemera society. I think he's also past president of the daguerreotype society at one point. So I think of him as sort of Mr. Photograph, that he knows <laughs> if I have any photographic collection, um, questions, he always answers them. He's uh, bi almost bi-coastal. Arizona's not quite on the West Coast, but um, goes back and forth between New York and Arizona. Has published extensively on Arizona as well as other topics, but has books out on Arizona photographers, Arizona real photo postcards, and areas Arizona st stereotype uh, graphs. He is the Emer uh, emeritus faculty of Arizona State, and he's a senior research. Um, scientist at NYU. So I want to introduce my dear friend, Jeremy Rowe. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Thank you, uh, everyone, for putting this conference together, and uh, glad to have you all here. I'm going to move to a little bit earlier time period, about 40 years earlier than the, uh, the previous presentation, and uh, move a little bit farther west. Um, Arizona, thought I'd give you a little bit of background on Arizona, a typical map. Most of the 19th century folks in the era that we're talking about had never been to Arizona, never heard about Arizona, never seen any images of Arizona. It um, was the Arizona, New Mexico territory. It was broken out February 24th, 1863, and was the fifth largest territory at the time. Uh, end of the Civil War, um, very, very few people here, very uh, limited uh, knowledge of Arizona in the area. 1860, there were about 6,000 people with uh, 2,400 of those being Anglo, the rest being a native population. Increased about just under 10,000 by 1870. Big boost by 1880, 40,000 people, and so on. By 1900, there were 122,000 people in Arizona. 1870, there were about 3.8 million people in London, just to give you an idea of scale and scope and how unusual it was. People saw images of Arizona from woodcuts and illustrations. This is from uh, 1858, from the uh, 1861 Ives survey. Um, they tended to be artistic representations rather than photographs because no one made photographs during that time period that we've been able to find. Even though people went back and forth to the California gold rush through Arizona, Nobody made photographs that are extant that we were able to identify as being made in Arizona. The earliest I've been able to find is 1864. This is an example of one of the uh, paddle wheel steamers that was used on the Colorado River during that time period. One of the illustrations also of the saguaro cactus, which shows what happens when a, so when a saguaro cactus dies. They explode. No, that doesn't happen. But this is the kind of imagery that people saw. Uh, very similar to things in the Middle, Middle East and the uh, Grand Tours. This is an uh, uh, ancient artifact, a building in Arizona. No way to look at scale until you put somebody in place. You put some staffage there, you get human scale, you get an idea of what the size was. Without that scale, people would have no idea what things were like at the time. Same with the cacti. They would put people next to the cacti, usually very, very small people, to make the cacti look very large. I actually have photographs of one person that was uh, kneeling on his boots so that he would be shorter to make the saguaro cactus look larger. Uh, so you see a lot of these sorts of things. Um, Kevin did a very nice job of covering later photography. I'm going to talk a little bit about earlier. These were wet plate photographs as opposed to dry plate photographs. They were also on 5 by 7 inch glass plates typically or larger. The photographer had to carry the glass plates and all the chemistry and a dark tent and in often cases in Arizona in the West, water with them to do all the processing they went through. 
photo equipment like this weighed about 150 pounds for uh, a typical batch of um, um, uh, travel that someone would do. You weren't able to buy chemistry at the store. You would have to get chemistry from either St. Louis, um, Salt Lake City, um, California, and bring it across. So it was a very difficult thing to be able to pull uh, processing together. You could make photographs, process who didn't like it, script the emulsion off, re-photograph them again. Wet plate, you mixed uh, collodion, which is a very thick um, syrup, poured it on almost like honey on the glass plate, floated on the glass plate, dipped it in a tank to sensitize it, shot it, had to process it before it dried, which in Arizona with the high temperature and low humidity was often challenging, then pack everything back up and go. Um, there's a, a story about a photographer whose life was actually saved by using wet plate photography because it took him so long to get out. Everybody else left. They were attacked by Apaches. He was not and uh, was able to get back. They indicated in the papers that he had been, that had been killed when he showed up several months later. It uh, sort of shocked the community that he was still alive after uh, photos saved his life. I'm going to talk with you about stereo cameras or stereo photography and stereographs. This is a camera from my collection. It's a typical stereo camera from that era. Two lenses, roughly the same separation as your eye. One makes a left eye image, one makes a right eye image. And if you process those, print them, transpose them, and mount them, put them in a viewer, you get a 3D effect. They're very, very popular uh, mass media during the uh, 19th century, starting in the mid-1850s and up into the 1930s. Um, these are some examples of um, ephemeral photographs of people showing that. The one on the left is a woman with a uh, stereoscope and cards on the table. The one on the right is a tintype uh, of a woman posed with her stereo collection and the cards. Earliest images of Arizona, 1864. You really didn't see many copies. There were very, very um, few copies made of most of these images until 1871, 72 with the Wheeler survey and Powell survey. This is uh, Fred Loring. He was a uh, uh, artist for the um, uh, illustrator, and he was actually killed just after this photograph was taken, about four hours later after the photograph was taken. It was uh, very popular. He was in Leslie's Magazine uh, Illustrator, so they made a, um, reproductions of images here, published those, and um, that was one of the first images and the first uh, stories people heard from Arizona. Wheeler Expedition, as they're taking off, uh, they left from Fort Mojave, this survey actually rode upstream against the Colorado River into the Grand Canyon. They didn't flow downstream with the river. They actually flowed against the current and carried material up to the top of the canyon, gave it to people who took it to Salt Lake City, which then took it by train back, and then they took things back down again. It was just an amazing uh, effort on their part. Wheeler Expedition was primarily an um, engineering expedition and geographic expedition, so they did much more documentation of um, the fauna and flora. People never seen cacti like this before. If you notice in the lower right of each of these images, there's a hat. Again, staffage or putting something in for scale. Um, I love some of these images, some great ones of rocks with hats and very abstract, uh, really beautiful images. This one's by Timothy O'Sullivan, uh, Bell. A number of other people did work on that, um, on that genre. Each year they would have different photographers, or not different photographers every year, but they had they exchanged photographers over the years, so s several people made this uh, excursion. We also had the Powell survey, which is more an ethnographic survey that focused more on uh, ethnographic documentation. And um, Powell sold material. He was uh, licensing some of his material. He actually bought a home in Washington, D.C. at the end of his uh, area of his uh, surveys by selling photographs and making the money on the photographs to buy his home. Here's another one. These are the uh, uh, Mormon and Gentile spectators with uh, Indians uh, on the bottom. These are Paiutes. And uh, this has a little bit of another ephemeral twist to it. The red ballpoint pen at the top is a collector named Beck, uh, collected in the 1940s and 50s. And unfortunately, he made red ballpoint pen markings on the photographs, in some cases, writing on one side with arrows on the other side. He was a historian, not a photographer, not a photo historian. Uh, many, many people have spent a lot of money trying to figure out how to get red ballpoint pen off of albumin prints unsuccessfully. You can bleach it, but you really can't pull it off. It's both engraved or embossed in the image, and the, the ink is uh, almost impossible to get off. The focus of my talk is uh, Dudley Flanders. He was a photographer, entrepreneurial photographer from California. He was um, one of the individuals that sort of traveled back and forth, a variety of partnerships in the Los Angeles area. Uh, he was a partner uh, with Henri Penlin at one point. Uh, 
Penland was a gentleman that was an artist who had an earlier studio in, in Los Angeles area. Flanders traveled around the country, landed in Los Angeles, had a studio in the Godfrey uh, Downey Block, and uh, was a partner with another gentleman named Godfrey. So there were a lot of fluid partnerships here. I can't go into a lot of detail there. That's another 45 minutes or an hour of who is where, who learned from who, where the studios were, and so on. But an example, unfortunately, the studio signage is not, a, not extant. I've not been able to find a photograph of the signage. But uh, this is an example of the stereo views. And again, these put in a viewer are 3D. I consider them artifacts and objects, so I try and show them in whole rather than details, uh, except pulling details out periodically. But I want to give you a feel for that. Flanders was sort of inspired by the Wheeler and Powell surveys. And this is the first commercial expedition that I've been able to find that came to Arizona to make photographs of Arizona to sell, to help market Arizona, to talk about Arizona, and to use that as a, a reason for making the photographs. Number one is San Bernardino. <clears throat> he left from San Bernardino and worked his way across through Arizona. There's about 100 images in the series. Um, when I started looking, I couldn't find any in uh, public collections. I found a few over time. Most of these have been collected over 30 years, piece by piece by piece, putting it all together, trying to figure out the number sequences. There's one series that was printed in Arizona that has one numbering, another series that's printed in California that has a different numbering. Some of it's chronological, partially, some of it's not. So I'll, I'll give you sort of a, a run, but based on a, a numerical sequence, each of the red areas here outlines his path and the route that we're gonna follow as we work our way through Arizona. Atkinson Station on the Mojave River, these are early images of California as he's working his way through to Arizona. Um, comment was made about ephemeris and people not keeping track of provenance. The first three images here came from a yard sale from a relative uh, descendant of Flanders that was sold in Oregon about 18, 19 years ago that wound up working their way through the, the network. Luckily, they stayed together, and I was able to acquire those and, and pull those back together again. This shows you what travel was like in, in California and Arizona during this time period. This is one of the more elaborate uh, stage tote stops. People would be living on coffee, salt pork, uh, sleeping on the porch, or in some cases, uh, there's a, uh, a note from the time of someone that had the luxury of sleeping on the soft wooden floor as opposed to on the ground as they were going back and forth across here. They typically took a small wagon, not quite a stagecoach, and they were nothing like the Eastern uh, Concord coaches. It was much rougher, much more uh, difficult travel during that time. From Atkinson Station, we go to Cottonwood Station. Uh, another idea, you can see the uh, ruts from the wheels, and uh, uh, typically they would change horses at this, these places and sometimes stay overnight. Anywhere from 10 to 30 miles would be a good day, sometimes as much as 50 if they really got started early. Uh, it would take them eight or 10 days to go some of these uh, routes between uh, areas. Uh, California, a little bit calmer than Arizona. Arizona had um, renegade Apaches, uh, Paiute, um, Mexican bandits, Anglo bandits, uh, weather, all the various challenges during this time period. So it's pretty rough travel. Here's another one that's called Soda Lake, uh, right on the California borders, or working way across. And I still am able to find one. This is one of my most recent acquisitions. A friend of mine, um, found this one for me. This is number seven, another gap in the numbering system here. This is looking north up the Colorado River, which means this is the last outhouse in California before you crossed at Hardyville to go to Arizona. And uh, for some ephemeris and, and others, the outhouses and the privies are ex very important places to find because that's where you find bottles, tokens, other sorts of things there. So these old photographs, many people try and find them so they could track down the privy site so they can dig the privy site and find the kind of um, artifacts and objects there. First image that Flanders made in Arizona that I've been able to locate is this one, a group of uh, Native Americans just outside of Camp Beale Springs in the upper um, northwestern corner of the state as he's working way across. This looks like they just sort of stopped en route and these um, folks are looking to see what's going on with the uh, people traveling across, broke out his equipment and, and took a, a photograph. This is uh, the soldiers and scouts at Camp Beale Springs, which is one of the major uh, forts in that area in the upper northeastern part of the state. Many of these forts were put in place just after the, the Civil War to try and protect the miners because mining was the big issue, trying to get um, gold, silver, and so on out of Arizona. Not a lot of settlement going on at that time. It was more mining and mining community and entrepreneurial activity. 
This is the stagecoach top. You can see just the edge of the stagecoach uh, on the other side there. Again, not like a Concord coach, open coach top with a little bit of canvas on the sides. Very, very brutal um, travel. Uh, this is the stagecoach office, post office, uh, livery office in Wickenburg, Arizona, which is south and west of Prescott as they were working their way through. Group of um, miners and prospectors. Uh, typically, it was a, uh, typically done with a uh, mule loaded material, either walking out or uh, mule train carrying equipment with you. All the equipment would have to be shipped across if a mine was more developed and you started looking at um, stamp mill or other sorts of things that all came from California, usually either around the Horn or across to Yuma, then up the Gila River and then carried across. Very, very difficult to get large machinery and large mechanical devices and um, other sorts of supplies anywhere in this uh, area. Unlike California with a very elaborate um, uh, hydraulic mining, this is uh, flume mining on the Hasayampa River. Uh, very, very primitive um, you know, barrels to haul water, the sluice to be able to put some of the ore after it's crushed in to wash the water across to try and get the, the ore in place. Um, many of the areas of Arizona were found, were, were mined because they were so rich that you didn't have to do this sort of processing. You could just walk through the creeks and pick up gold nuggets or you know, pull the ore out. Once that was gone, then you started doing this process, then you started doing ore crushing, and then larger scale um, mining efforts followed at that point. Flanders made it to um, Prescott very quickly and established, a, he, he rented time in a gallery, but established a business there. This is the first photographic studio. This was established by Francis Cook, Carlo Chantile, Francis Cook, a number of the early photographers in Arizona used this building. Uh, until this photograph was found, nobody realized that they had what are called solar enlargers in Arizona. They thought it was very, very primitive. If you look, there's a little trap door. Let's see if I can, uh, right there. That's actually a, a solar enlarger. It would have a lens that you would place towards the sun. You put your negative in there and you'd have a print behind that that you would then, it would enlarge under that print. Typically very, very faint prints that you would then do a crayon portrait or in, enhance with either um, graphite or oil or other sorts of things to do, but nobody thought those were made in Arizona during this era until we started finding gallery that had this sort of capability. Uh, again, very, very primitive. You can also see on the top the uh, lighting control um, mechanism that they'd put in place so that they could either shade or control the light and the skylight at the top. But um, the studio was the place in northern Arizona, and all the photographers would come through and either borrow, rent, or uh, purchase this place, use it for a number of years, number of months, travel, and move on from there. The prints in Arizona tend to be not quite as high quality, ephemeral prints. The photographs tend to fade. They weren't processed very well, whether they were done in Prescott or in Tucson, which I'll talk about a little bit later. The earlier mounts are all orange colored mounts with uh, handwritten notations on the side. Again, the mounts would have been brought over from California as well, so we brought the mounts, the glass, the chemistry, all the other equipment with him and carried that everywhere he went um, around through Arizona. Uh, these are just not processed very well, so they're a little bit lighter. Occasionally you find better quality copies that were done in California after he got over on the other mounts, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, again, sort of ephemeral notations on the back. This is a Flanders and Penland mount. Flanders and Penland were partners when they came across, but Penland became very ill in January and passed away. They came across in December 1873, January 1874, Penland passed away, wasn't part of the uh, uh, partnership from that point on, so all of the other material that was produced was produced by Flanders or other people that he met en route. So um, unfortunately, they couldn't reproduce these. Some of them have the Penland scratched out, but they use the vintage mount and typically, uh, you know, crocodile pen or pen notations on the back if you're very lucky to try and find an ID for the person that's in the photograph. Mentioned Prescott and the mining. This is uh, Elliott's factory. This was a uh, mining support facility to help develop things for the miners. Incredible in 3D. He had really good sense of 3D and the placement of objects and placement of the camera to be able to make the 3D effect really, really strong and powerful. But uh, this shows a water tank on the uh, right-hand side, uh, a forge. Um, this was where people had things made and then would take them out, maybe even days or weeks at a time to be able to come in and get something done and then carry it back out to another location to make things work. They also, because the ore was uh, starting to get uh, the placer, uh, things that they could just pick up were becoming rarer. So this is uh, actually an arastra that they built. This is powered by Granite Creek with a small 
paddle wheel with water going through, and it turned this mechanism, which had heavy weights on the bottom, rocks on the bottom, which would crush the ore, and then you could take the ore and process it. They wouldn't do a lot of processing in Arizona. They would send it to California for processing, and in some cases, the mines in Arizona actually sent it back to Cornwall, England, and the ore would be shipped other places because the ore couldn't be processed effectively because of the chemical makeup of the of the ore, but it was rich enough that it was worth the shipping to San Francisco and then by boat across from there. Um, one of my favorite areas, this has another shot of um, Flanders' uh, photographic wagon there. It was done white because it was so hot in the area, but it was also very visible for any bandits or other people to follow, so it was kind of dangerous having a white wagon there. This is the Camp Verde Reservation. Uh, they started forming a reservation in that area in the spring. Luckily, he was there during that time. The um, um, Tonto and um, Yavapai Apache in that area were all gathered together and then moved to another reservation in southern Arizona, which we'll see in a few moments. Um, Flanders was there at the right time to document them at both ends. So I'll show you the front end and the back end of that um, transition of the tribal uh, members from uh, northern to southern Arizona for that. This is one of my favorites that he took, um, stereo view of a Tonto Apache family at the reservation, the Fort Verde reservation, as they were being um, pulled together for the move. This one is a, a typical example um, of an image that is made in non-stereo, but made as a stereo image to be able to sell. All the stereo images have a slight offset, so if you look in the left and the right image, you're going to see a slight offset one way or the other on all the images that show in 3D. If you put this in a viewer, it's going to be magnified, but it's going to be flat. You're not going to see the 3D because it's not separated by the left and the right eye images. Sometimes a plate would break and they would print one side of the plate twice. Sometimes they would decide that they wanted to make a stereo view of another image, so they'd make a copy and make it as a stereo and sell it that way. Um, the 3D effect was important, but the documentation was also important, so there's sort of a mix. So if you're a stereo purist, this is a mono image, not a stereo image, and some people poo-poo those. I don't care. The content's more important to me, and this is the only copy that surfaced that I'm aware of right now, so I'm happy to have it. Um, in addition to the stereo views and selling the views and selling photographs, um, Flanders also supported his trip by making stereoptican presentations. Some people call the stereoptican viewers in the slides. No, stereoptican is a lantern slide that's projected. And this is an example of one of the lantern slide projectors that he brought from California with him and carried in his wagon and worked his way through. By taking half of a stereo view, you can make a lantern slide. You put the lantern slide in a viewer and you can project it to a group. Not like this, it would have been done with, um, you know, typically just a, uh, a flame either a kerosene lamp, not very bright. Um, later, they would have acetylene uh, carbide. They would make acetylene that would make it a little bit brighter. But uh, they would sell slide presentations, basically. So you would advertise this from the newspaper in Prescott. There was no Phoenix, so Maricopa Wells, which is a stagecoach stop south of Phoenix, where he did other presentations, and then Tucson, charging a little bit of money each time. He would also make carte visites and cabinet cards to sell to try and make money while he was en route to try and support his, um, his efforts. A friend of mine passed away and hadn't told me he had this. Uh, this was left to me, um, one of my holy grail images that I started with. This is number 47. I'd never figured out what 47 was until I got this card. This is actually a self-portrait of Dudley Flanders with his wagon, with his dark tent, with a negative. Uh, if you do an enlargement, this is a, a shot which shows what he was traveling with, what his wagon looked like, and how he was carrying material. Uh, you'll see later he did studio portraits as well. He was also carrying... Uh, studio props, a backdrop, reflectors, um, a, um, a chair, a posing chair. Everything was crammed in this wagon along with all of his other equipment as they worked his way through. Just an unbelievable effort. And again, this is way before the, not way, five years before the railway came through. So there's no railroad here. It's all horse, wagon, buggy, mule, um, occasionally steamboat or paddle boat up to certain areas and then off and away from there. So very, very primitive, very, very rough condition. After he left Prescott and the um, uh, Camp Verde area with the uh, Native American population there, he went down to Tucson. This is a place called Maricopa Wells, which was the stagecoach stop and telegraph office uh, in the middle, and um, work our way through from there. Um, this is the um, center of Maricopa Wells. This is a dipping tank where there was actually water near the surface that was not found until a drunk was challenged to be a diviner. He said it could be divine if it would 
put him up and give him a drink, he actually found water in the middle of the staging area at Maricopa Wells and worked his way through that. Um, they had no idea, and that was what supplied water from that point forward. My Holy Grail, there's only one copy of this that surfaced, I'm second in line for it, is uh, this image, uh, unbelievable image, taken in Tucson, spring of 1874 of a Mexican circus. Until you see a photograph, you have no idea what Mexican cir circus looks like. In the literature, they talk about Mexican circuses, but what is that? This has high wire trapeze, it has uh, bareback riders, and they traveled across the border during this time period. And until you see something like this with people, there are, um, you know, there's a um, you know, perform high wire performer, there's someone dangling from the uh, top, there's performers down the bottom. Just an unbelievable image. But again, until you find the photograph, you can read all about it, but it doesn't really tell you much, and you don't, it, you don't understand. Here's the um, Papago School at uh, Santa Vera. This is the uh, um, Native American education program. They had uh, uh, Sister Hyacinth is one of them. I don't know exactly which one. I've identified her in some other images. But uh, the Native American uh, children, many of them opening books in the foreground, sort of metaphor of the uh, education at that time. Uh, Flanders took on a partner, Juan Rodrigo, who was active in Hermosillo, Mexico, and also in Tucson during this time because he needed some help. This is a portrait of uh, Rodrigo that was taken in California slightly earlier, give an idea of what he looked like. That took a lot of tracking. A friend of mine um, found that in his collection and shared it with me. This is a shot of uh, Rodrigo's and Flanders en route to the San Carlos Reservation in southern Arizona. Again, carrying everything with them, not, not with their wagon now. They've got everything packed on mules and horses as they're carrying things through. This is uh, Camp Bowie Apache Pass, which is one of the famous forts in southern Arizona that uh, was um, protected there. And these are the officers and wives living there. You can see a very heavy adobe building, very small windows because they needed to protect themselves in case of attack. And um, not the best place to be in Arizona with uh, summers and heat and uh, packed into a small building like this with uh, no supplies. Fort Grant, uh, Camp Grant initially, as they were building another uh, location down there, is just starting to populate. 1874, they're starting to do more development of the camps and forts to uh, support travel in Arizona during this era. This is the guardhouse that was being built, uh, first major building that was put in place there. And about this time, the San Carlos Reservation was being put together. They'd moved the Yavapai and uh, Tonto Apache from northern Arizona down. They'd also captured some of the renegade Apaches below. And this is uh, a group of Eskimos and, and Apaches. The, if you look at this blown up, you see uh, leg irons and uh, shackles. Uh, this is in front of the guardhouse that we just saw that um, Flanders was able to take. You notice the numbers on these, the number 80, very similar to what uh, Kevin mentioned. They would make notations in the negative to be able to keep track of negatives and work their way through. And again, they're reversed um, because of the printing process. The uh, gentleman in the center wearing the pith helmet is uh, George Crook. He was a, a Civil War general and uh, was in charge of um, the uh, military in Arizona at various periods of time. This was the 1874 cycle. He wound up going to the Dakotas and then coming back in the mid-80s to deal with Geronimo and was involved in the capture of Geronimo. But these are all of his scouts. I've been able to blow this up. Uh, Kevin mentioned how... Um, sharp these are. These are all contact prints from those negatives. And I've been able to blow this up and get individual faces uh, from the individuals and uh, do identification there. These are another shot from that era. This is an unidentified um, Apache agent. We're still trying to identify who he is with the group posed there. The replacement agent we've identified, this is John Clum, very famous in Arizona. He became the um, editor of the Tombstone Epitaph, and he wound up going to Alaska, becoming the postmaster of Alaska, a very elaborate trail. You can see the backdrop that was carried on the wagon for them to be able to make photographs. Here's a portrait that he did at the time. This is um, Jose, a White Mountain Apache scout, with the posing stand that he'd carried from California with him, the little fringed uh, chair that he was sitting on. Another example, this is uh, Casadora, one of the Apache um, uh, sub-chiefs with his wives that was taken there. And again, with the studio props, the rug, and, and so on that they had carried with them as they worked their way through. Another shot, these are Apache women and children at the San Carlos Reservation. To give you an idea of how many of the uh, native population had been uh, consolidated at San Carlos during that time period, this is Muster Day when they were giving out supplies. And uh, 
uh, each of the different tribes would have a, a, um, a uh, little um, badge, um, either a, a rectangle, a triangle, a circle that would identify you with as, as a scout for a particular tribal affiliation so they would not put you with the wrong scouting party going after another batch of uh, uh, Apaches during that, that time period. Those are also very, very collectible. Um, this is one of the other recent images I got. A friend of mine that's been helping supply me with these things said, I, I got one, it's just a, I know you've already got this one, this image, you've, you've got, got to have copies of it, it's nothing. So please send it to me so I can take a look at it. No, 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 I finally got it from him. This is the ferry boat from Cuma going across. Flanders got very, very ill in Tucson as he was en route back over. Rodrigo helped him get back to Yuma probably not able to take photographs. So this is a Rodrigo photograph, I believe. It's also a mount that I'd never seen before. And um, so that was great. Turn it over on the back, that's Rodrigo's hand, which I've been able to do um, manuscript identification from other photographs that I have in my collection to be able to tie it back. So that all starts fitting together. After he got back, the yellow images that you saw, Flanders printed those, sold them very, very heavily, and uh, or tried to sell them very heavily. They're still very rare. Uh, very few collections have many Flanders images in them. I've got the largest collection, I think, going at this point. But um, the images themselves were pirated. The one at the top is Prescott, Arizona. This is pirated by um, the, uh, uh, not Continent, but I'm sorry, the um, Standard View Company. And they would make copies of these negatives and resell them. The one on the bottom is uh, Stanton and Payne Company. They actually bought the negatives from Flanders and published those. So you find these images on other mounts printed later as well. So anyway, Quick travel, following a person around, hopefully an interesting uh, set of stories about Arizona, Arizona travel, and uh, images that were made in stereo to have you think about stereo a little bit. Here's my uh, tail end, and thank you all, and uh, any questions or thoughts, I'm happy to see what I can do for you. to get to the off and away, but thank you. Okay. Okay. The circus photo, I think, was about 1874, five. Right. 1874, spring. And you had shown in your population numbers that you've only got 9,000 people in Arizona at this time, in yep. all of Arizona. In all of Arizona. Tucson was much smaller than that, a couple of thousand people at that time. So what's the audience for this circus, and how wide do you think they're traveling? The circus has traveled from uh, Texas. Can you talk to the microphone, please? Okay, sure. The uh, circus has traveled from, uh, from the t Texas border across New Mexico, Arizona, and into Southern California. Um, I don't know a lot about them other than the Arizona time. They would advertise in the paper in Tucson, and people would come. You know, it was an event. People would come in uh, to town for that. There would probably be a couple hundred people, not much more. I don't have any idea what the cost was. I've seen several notices there. It's, you know, the, the same sort of uh, limited cost. But these are public spaces outside. It's not like a tent or enclosed, so it's very difficult for them to monetize that otherwise. So I think somebody... Um, you know, it may have been other people in the town, other merchants that would have the circus come to town to draw people from outside to have more population in the town to deal with. I'm not sure at this point. There's another trail to follow. Okay. Nope. Yeah, this is a, a question I was sort of putting on hold, and I thought, well, maybe it's not interesting, but it, it interests me. I noticed a difference in composition of the cards quite a lot, yep. particularly when you noted the uh, the stereo effect of the closer view with the near thing and the middle thing and the far thing, mm -hmm. but what I would call an earlier style, which is sort of tableau vivant, kind of the, the picture plane is parallel to the film plane, yep. and it's not stacked up. Have you given any thought to that kind of a thing? Or I've been trying to tease that out for a while, yeah. Um, there are several photographers that have sort of a look and feel or have a certain uh, sensibility for, for stereo and how they put that together. <clears throat> I've seen some people pop in and out because they have a market for a certain type of image or there's not a location that they can get to be able to do that foreground, background. Um, the um, uh, places like the Camp Verde, it was a very flat area and they were trying to get that large population in, so that's one aesthetic that they were using. Then he went in and did detail shots of individuals. So some of the portraits and uh, the, the 
closer shots have much more interest, but there was Penland for a period of time, there was Flanders for a period of time, there was Rodrigo for a period of time. There may have been other people that have been involved that we've not been able to locate. So I've got at least three different eyes that are involved in those compositions and putting that together. Trying to tease that out, I can drop Penland out for anything taken after his, his passing, but the others, it's very, very difficult to try and pull together, and there's not enough of a body of work that's identified by one person to say, this person did all of this, so you can start getting a feel for that and work it through. Others, like um, Rothrock and some of the other later photographers, you can get a feel for their eye, and you can just look at it and say, that's a Rothrock, and you know that's a Rothrock, you know how he put things together. Everything has that look and feel. Because it's almost like a more modern look. Yeah. Uh, as you get more modern, so to speak. And I'm wondering if earlier photographers who were moving into that more modern look had looked at these. They must have looked at the earlier uh, yeah. cards and I stuff. I like images that are out of time, and some of those feel like they could have been made more contemporary. Like Absolutely. More, much, much later, the, the abstracts and others. Um, he was in California. There was a lot of, there were California salons. There were people looking at and exchanging images. There were a uh, Philadelphia photographer and other photographic journals that were out that had images in them. There were uh, Leslie's and Harper's that had woodcuts from illustrations from the photographs in them for composition. Many of these people were classically trained as artists, so they had that, um, that background. So um, it, it's really hard to tease out what all influences were involved there. But again, some of the images, just, they just strike you as being something that's, it doesn't feel like that right time. And even when you put them in 3D, some of them are just e even more amazing. Ah, yeah. But anyway. It's tough. It's obviously, I've got it bad for 3D. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, I would like to you to teach me, because I'm not a photography specialist, so I was looking at the stereo cards, mm -hmm. you know, the photos are pasted on, and then at least I found three different types. And the yellowish says like a Flanders photographer, and the other one said uh, Flanders camera artist, mm -hmm. and the third one is nothing. So these cards are kind of mass produced by somebody else in a sense. Yeah, the, the, the cards were done, were, were typically, there are blank cards that people would just manuscript uh, ID on. There are other cards that were printed, and you would have a job printer that would print those out for you. You would take the blank cards, and then you would mount the, make, process the photographs, and then mount the photographs. Again, those are cropped down, as Kevin mentioned, from five by seven, they're, they're cropped down, and you can see differences in where they were taken from the plate as they were, were trimmed and cut. Okay. Um, I've got uh, glass templates that are shaped that they would put down and use to trim the, the two cards. Then you put them in place and use a viewer to align them to mount them. So you couldn't produce them the way that the postcards were produced. They were manually produced, typically. Um, occasionally, the copies once you transpose them, you could make a copy on a single sheet, print that, and then just mount that single sheet like the uh, pirates were done mm. on a single sheet. But most of the others are two unique images that are transposed and manually but mounted. But the cards would have been carried with them and, and printed. You could have had a job printer in Tucson print cards or a job printer. You know, people would could order cards other places. Arizona was very difficult to do that, so most all the stuff had to be brought in. Uh, well, my interest period. was that what would be printed on the side would be determined by the person who is going to put the photo on, right? N not always. These not had tipped always? on labels. The, the, the photographer would have a, often a label on the side saying, this is my work, labeling a photographer, but then the image would be identified either in ink on the, on the mount and, and printed in the image or as a little tag on the mount. Okay. The ones that he had were manuscript on the side of the mount or uh, letterpress printed and glued on the bottom of the mount. Okay, I was just curious that Flanders one time determined himself like an artist and a photographer and started taking more artistic photos than photographer documentary type photos. It's not true. I, I think that's, it's not necessarily random, but it, it's something that would change over time and you see some photographers uh, advertise as an artist sometimes, a photographer sometimes. The mounts would change because it was um, almost like fins on the Cadillacs. I mean, you, you want to have the, the latest color mount. The mount styles change. The sizes would change mm -hmm. slightly from either a standard to a larger size. Rounded corners, uh, gold embossed. I mean, they would do different things to try and make it enticing for you to buy more stereo views. But mm -hmm. during this time, you know, no TV, no magazines, no newspapers other than woodcut illustrations that you'd see. So these were, there were little stacks of these in just about every parlor around the country. And people from Arizona would buy these and send them to friends, uh, people that were doing uh, mining uh, and 
uh, say the, the Prescott area, they would invest in the, um, um, the mines, they would take the stereo views and send them other places to say, this is what you're investing in. This is uh, documentation of how we're spending your money. Or uh, like Prescott, they would send those out to say, you know, here's our town. It's a wonderful town. Here's a shot of the church and the, the building. Here's a panorama of the town. You can come out here, there's something built. And this is the evidence that they would use to sort of promote the town and, and get things out at that level. Well, thank you. Good. <laughs> um, you mentioned something about the numbering and how there's some variation. Have you come across a list that has the complete listing? Because sometimes you do get those. You yeah, get if, lucky if you and at, they, they have it posted on the back. In general, there are often uh, publication yeah. lists on the back. Mm -hmm. The largest numbered list on the back of an Arizona Stereo View that I've found in 30 plus years is three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, it's, it's r ridiculous. Every place else has these master lists of, you know, 80 cards and you put a, a, mm -hmm. a pencil line or an ink line underneath. This is the card uh, image yeah. on the other side of the card. That doesn't doesn't work in Arizona, unfortunately. <laughs> I've been trying to compile those for a long time. Our pipe dreams, huh? <laughs> yeah. or, or even a catalog. I mean, finding a catalog. Right. There are no extant print catalogs for Arizona photographers that I've been able to find in any public or private collection anywhere pre-1900. It's, you know, holy grail stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> so you have to manually piece things together time by time by time. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you.